Hallelujah. Now, it's, uh, there are, should be, enough chairs for everybody in here. So fight and find yourself once. And if you want to swing your chairs around to make sure you can still see. I know that looks don't matter. But don't let my good looks distract you. I know, I know, it's hard. Right then, is everybody, <laughs> praise the Lord. If you have a Bible with you, could you turn with me please to Micah chapter 1. Ooh. Well, I'm just looking what's going on here, what's, uh... you need another table. No, right, fair enough. Do you guys want to swing your table back a bit and let's bring that one in again. And just for the... For those who are listening to this on YouTube at the moment, our 200 have now been joined by another 200. It's an epic night tonight. There are over a thousand people in Grace Pentecostal Church. Unbelievable. You can hear them all. <laughs> bring your table forward. Bring it forward. Come and join us. There we go. Very good. Right. Hopefully you found Micah chapter 1, because there is so much, look, it's like a feast on that table. Oh, I'm going to be so distracted watching that. I am, yeah, clearly. No wonder. Micah chapter 1. Uh, so tonight, if you've joined us for the first time, the reason most of the tables have got a microphone on, we do record these and we put them on YouTube because there are people who want to hear the Bible studies but they just can't get here uh, because of babysitting and other issues, so we do that. What we found is when we do the Bible reading around, all they heard was just a blank noise for about 15 minutes and wondering if we'd all gone, and then all of a sudden I start preaching again. So if you want to read a verse, if I say let's turn to this and you say, actually I'd like to read, grab the microphone and read it down so that on our recording, it's not because you all need microphones tonight, but it's just so the recording picks that up. So hopefully now you've found Micah chapter 1, and we'll have a good read around. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple, for behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split like wax before the fire. Like waters poured down a steep place. And all of this is for the transgressions of Jacob, for the sins of the house of Israel. What is that transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Verse 6. Therefore I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field. Places for planting a vineyard, I will pour down her stones into the valley. And I will uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall not be, be, beaten, in to be beaten to pieces. And all her pay is har a harlot shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, I will make a wailing like the jackals, and a mourning like the ostriches, for her wounds are incurable, for it ha has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all in Beth. Afra, roll yourself in the dust. Pass by in naked shame, you inhabitants of Shafir. The inhabitant of Zanan does not go out. Beth is Elmorn's. Its place to stand is taken away from you. Verse 12. For the inhabitants of Maroth pined for good, but disaster came down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. O inhabitants of Lachish. Harness the chariot of the swift steeds. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in you. 
Therefore, you shall give presents to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Akshib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. I will yet bring her heir to you, O inhabitants of Moresheth. The glory of Israel shall come to Abdullah, Abdullah. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your boldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. Amen. Well, what a cheery book. <laughs> to start with, you could say that with every one of the minor prophets as we come. And so as we start a new book, I just want to remind you of some things that we have to remember when we're studying the prophets. The Bible is made up of 66 books, but each of those books are actually what we call different literary genres. You read poetry books differently to reading a historical book. You'd read a law book very differently to reading something like Job, which is a drama. So because these books are written in a different way, we have to study them sometimes completely to differently. We are continuing this 15-month study of looking at all the minor prophets. There's only 36 weeks left. So not long to go. And the study of these minor prophets, we're studying the letters. Like reading someone's sermon, prophetic literature is to be treated completely different. Now that might seem strange, but what we're looking at is the way that the Bible is actually written. We have to remember, fundamentally, it's a Jewish book. And that's the bit where everybody kind of falls down straight away. They're looking, or think they're reading a Greek book because it's written in Greek. But it's not. It's a Jewish book. And it's written with a Jewish mindset. And so we have to come to understand that. Now, what do I mean? Well, it's as simple as this. From a, a Western culture, we believe prophecy is, here's a suggestion, and then here's its fulfillment. Almost a bit like a kind of, a, a, I'm trying to say, a fortune teller or something like that. Here is the, prediction, the prophecy, here's the prediction, here's its fulfillment. But in Jewish thinking, they understand that prophecy is pattern. There is a final fulfillment, but then there are many fulfillments that go on throughout the time. And the best example of that, of course, is to understand that principle about uh, coming out of Egypt. Abraham comes out of Egypt. The children of Israel come out of Egypt. Jesus comes out of Egypt. And we, the church, figuratively come out of Egypt. So you see that pattern, and it's completed each one. We go through the Red Sea, we have our wilderness wanderings. These things are copied over and over again. That rule is called Midrash, and we teach Midrashic teaching here. It helps to explain what we already have in the plain text, but it doesn't form the basis of our doctrine. It merely helps to explain it, and it gives an example. I want to explain the Passover lamb is a type of Jesus. And we understand from the Passover lamb that Jesus would die, he wouldn't have his bones broken, that it would be the blood that would spare the angel of death, but we don't believe salvation because of the Passover lamb. That just gives it as an example. We believe salvation because the Bible teaches exactly what salvation is. That Jesus would have to come and die and he would have to take away our sins. That gives you an idea. So as we look at these prophecies, we're going to ask four questions. What was the meaning to the people at the time? What is the application of that meaning then to us as individuals? Can't just take it and apply it to yourself. Does the chapter in any way point to Jesus' first or second comings? And then are there any other interesting spiritual points, numerical understandings or patterns that jump out? Now, <clears throat> one of the patterns that is jumping out to us that's interesting is sometimes we forget the book of, or the minor prophets used to be one book. So all 12 of the minor prophets were meant to be read together, one after another, because they actually have a message that goes on through all 12 books. The Holy Spirit designed it and gives us this flowing message. Hosea told us about what happens when you stray into unbelief. Joel tells us exactly where that unbelief goes and tells you exactly how it will end. And then why you need to be on the right side of the Lord on the day of the Lord. Amos then tells us to be careful to see that it's the right God that you're following after. And not a false one. And not some made up version of Jesus. But that it is the true religion that you are following. Teaches us to open our eyes and look at what's playing in front of us. 
as we remember from the book of Amos, the children of Israel who lived in Samaria were worshipping at a golden calf. They thought that was the temple. And it was very clear just from their own history that the last time they worshipped at a golden calf, it did not go well for them. Sometimes people don't look at the nose that's as plain on their face. They're looking for all kinds of this, that and the other, but the actual real answer is there in front of you. And then we get to Obadiah. He takes us into the Gentile world with a teaching on how sons of promises become Gentiles. How do the children of Israel become Gentiles? By rejecting their birthright because they reject the eternal just for what they can get today. They don't think about heaven. They don't think about eternity. They don't think about God's big plan. And that's really important. Hosea and Amos taught us about the northern kingdom. They taught us they would never be restored or returned. The prophetic message challenging them to leave that kingdom before it is destroyed. As the Bible says, come out of her, my people. And the only message of hope contained in that is that there will be a salvation through Jesus Christ. The hinted at church as a bride, and Amos even finishes with the time of Gentiles. So to those who remained in the northern kingdom, they'll be carried away. The Assyrians would breed them out of existence so that they were no longer pure Jews. They would no longer be sons of promise. They would be common Gentiles. And then Jonah, this tiny little book that's often used just by Sunday school teachers about an angry little man. When we actually read it and understand it in conjunction with the rest, we see that his life shows how that remnant of Israel that didn't reject its birthright will, and did because we know it has, reject it calling as being a priestly nation. It will be cast as dead for a time and then it will return to preach the gospel to the Gentiles in that tribulation period. So what does this sixth book now have to teach us about this overall picture? The book of My Micah. Micah, we're going to do starting already. Book of Micah. Who is Micah? He's this minor prophet that just keeps coming out at Christmas. Because he's the guy who mentions Bethlehem. Oh, we'll always quote Micah when it comes to Christmas. If we're having a nativity, we'll, we'll do the Micah quote. But he didn't just write one verse, he wrote seven chapters. So for the next seven weeks, we'll be looking at what his message is. So what's the meaning then? What is the meaning to the people of the time? What do we pull out of the, the book of Micah in this first chapter? So we're introduced, always we're introduced to the prophet in the first chapter. Where he comes from, what time he prophesies in, and reveals the nature of the book to us. And since minor prophets are called minor prophets not because of their length, but because they only have one or two messages at most, even though it may be lifted out and made bigger, what does it give us? Well, in Micah we're given so much information today, I think my real challenge will be getting it all out to you in some kind of order that makes sense. So hopefully you'll get the whole lot. So Micah, let's start off with his name. It's actually not his name. It's an abbreviated version of his name. Like taking David and calling him Dave. Or taking Jamie and calling him Jimmy. Actually, that's lengthening my name. But <coughs> Or it's the one taking Robert and calling him Bob. And I've never understood that one at all. I don't, I don't know how Robert becomes Bob. But there you go. It does, apparently. Derek becomes Des. So Micah's real name actually would be Miko Jar. Or Mika Jar. You know that's going to be a name for the next seven weeks, don't you? Know? Now, when we see the Yar on the end of something, we know what that's referring to. The Yar in the Hebrew always refers us to Yahweh, to Jehovah. It always tells us it's God. So, the name has God in the title. So it shouldn't be Micah, it should be Micah Yah. Micah Yah. You could, I've only got it as a phonetic, so uh, M W E K A W J A H. That is just phonetically, that's not the real word. M E M W E K A W J A H, if you want that. Anyway, 
So what does that name mean, putting it all together? It means this. Who is like God? Who is like God? So there you go now, son, you know what your name means. <laughs> well, that's it. You see, because if it's a question, if the question is, who's like God, then the answer is back, no one. No one's like God at all, which is a strange name to give to somebody. And the constant part is that his name means nobody's like God at all, or it's just meant to ask you that question. So if it's that, it's that. But if it's a title, if it's a title, Micah, well, it's, he is like God. Micah is like God. Now that'll go to your head, won't it? <laughs> what is that? Well, it's, it's our old favorite word. It's an anthropomorphic statement. That's a big word, and I had to look it up. It means we take something and we humanize it. So we humanize God. God is too vast for us to be able to hold him all in our, our view at the same time. And that's why we can't make an image of him, because an image limits who God is. But God is so big that we can only hold a small section of him at a time. And that's what Micah is doing here. He's holding a very small section of who God is. So in that question, he is like God, it's a proclamation. Micah, at this moment, represents God to the people. He has been sent to the people, and Micah represents God. So he is representing God to the people. And so, in a sense, we can really call this title, it's the title of every prophet. Because every prophet who is sent to give the message of the Lord, in that moment that they give the message to the Lord, they are like God. Because of the voice of the Lord. It's the voice of the Lord in that moment. They aren't God. Let's be clear there. But they're like God. They're not infallible like God's infallible. But also, let's be honest about prophets. They can't be right 99% of the time. They have to be right 100% of the time. And we saw that with Jonah. And, you know, he felt that God had made a liar out of him. He'd prophesied that Nineveh was going to be destroyed and God didn't destroy them. So that made him a false prophet. That meant he should have been stoned to death. But actually that was just his misunderstanding of what God was doing. So, this poor, weak, humble prophet, he actually represents all the prophets. In this moment, there is something that is amalgamating about his message that actually brings all the messages, not that we've just seen, but the ones of the major prophets, the ones of the prophets yet to be seen, and including the prophets that aren't even haven't got books, but they're in the Kings and they're in the Chronicles, and they're in Samuel, like Nathan. He represents them all. It tells us he came from Morishite, which is also a shortened version. It should be Morishite Gaff. Morishite Gaff. Now what does that mean? Well, he's a prophet from a territory of the Philistines. Who comes from Gath? Goliath comes from Gath. There, yeah, Sunday school teachers back out again. Goliath comes. Stop laughing, the pair of you. You're like a pair of schoolgirls, aren't you? I knew you would as well. The minute I was writing it down, at, I mean, 11 o'clock today. Yeah. I know we'll be laughing at this. Yeah. Anyway, Gath is a place of the Philistines. So what does that mean? Well, actually, this is somewhere that Judah has captured. It's theirs. They've taken it away from that hated enemy that represents the Antichrist, the kingdom of the Antichrist. Quite literally, it's a place that was the enemy's. They've gone to the enemy's camp and they've taken back what he's stolen from them. That's what this place represents. And that's where Micah is from. And it gives us that clue and understanding that this place now has been inhabited. It's been possessed. It's a place of victory. And so from a place of victory comes the voice of the Lord. From a place 
where victory has always been pronounced, a place that represents their own personal strength, the strength that God has given them over their enemies and over those who've oppressed them over all of these years, the Lord sends this prophet. And this prophet has got a word. He's been sent out. Now to back up that, to back up the idea that the prophet has been sent so firmly, this whole concept, we understand it's not just the prophet who's moving out. We also see the Lord moves out. And we see this phrase, the Lord is coming out of his place. Does anybody have anything different than place in their version of the Bible? That's verse 3. Dwelling place. His throne. And the direct understanding here is he is coming down from his throne. Now what do you think it takes to get God off his throne? You know, we're not talking Jesus here. We're talking the Father. We're talking about a situation where we start off, Mike has come out of a place of victory, and now God is coming off his throne. He's coming off his throne, and he's coming down. It's that kind of, wait till your dad gets home kind of moment, isn't it really? That kind of comes. The Lord is coming down. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it's because it is. We've seen it before in the Bible. But it's not in the Old Testament that we've seen it before. It's in the New Testament. So turn with me to the book of Revelation. And let's read Revelation chapter 10 and see exactly the same thing. (coughs) And we'll just quickly understand what Revelation 10 says to us. Revelation 10, the whole chapter. It's only 11 verses. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand towards heaven. He swore north in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who creates heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, the sea and every, everything in it. He said there will be more, no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. So when I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll, he said, Take it and eat it. He said, It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So he took the small scroll from his hand, the hand of the angel, and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned my stu- sour in my stomach. Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Amen. Now, the book of Revelation, this unveiling, we say, I've said this to you quite a lot, there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. Everything that's in the book of Revelation is somewhere else in the Bible. What the book of Revelation does is it takes all those ends and it brings them together so that we've got an understanding. And what we have here in chapter 10 is something that we see in a few chapters, it's called an interlude. It's a kind of a Not what's really going on, but here's a little conversation to help to instruct the situation. You're just before the seventh seal and the seventh uh, trumpet and the seventh bowl of wrath to be poured out, or all seven bowls of the wrath to be poured out. And we have this little interlude where we see the mighty angel. Now, who do you think that is? You guess it's, of course, it's Jesus. It is the Lord. We understand that by the description that's given there. This messenger that has come down, and of course it stands. Tells us it's clothed with a cloud. That's what we see in Jesus in Revelation 1. But why is he clothed with the cloud? Well, there's two verses that we need to look at. So, these two tables, can you find me? Well, this is going to be a hard one for you. Book of Lamentations, chapter 3, 
and verse 43 and 44. And these two tables, can you find me Isaiah 4.22? Much easier for you. So Lamentations 3, 43 to 44, and Isaiah 4.22. So why is he clothed in the clouds, first of all? Read away for us. He's still... <laughs> Lamentations 3, 43 to 44. 43 to 44. Have you ever covered yourself with anger and pursued us? You have slain and not pitied. You have covered yourself with a cloud and prayed at, at the that prayer should not pass through. Is that it? Yeah. You read that again for yes. us, because you went very quiet, yeah. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and not pitied. You have covered yourself with a cloud. That prayer should not pass through. So what is the cloud? It's the power of God. It's that Anger that the Lord has done. So what does Isaiah 4.22 say to us? Oh well, I've put the wrong one down. There'll probably be another. It might be 42 too. I do this all the time. I put me here thing. But we won't need to look around. What they represent, these clouds are the bit that stops the prayer going through. They represent sin which has blocked out the prayers of the people from the Lord. And therefore they are the reason for his anger. The Lord clothes himself in this anger. He comes out in it. Why has the Lord got to that stage? Well, in Revelation 9 and verses 20 to 21, we see that everybody refuses to repent. There's no repentance. They acknowledge God by blaspheming him and cursing him. So we have the Lord who's clothed in this righteous anger. This righteous anger that's stopping the prayers coming through because the people refuse to repent of their evil ways. He's clothed with a rainbow which represents the covenant that said that he wouldn't flood the earth again. His next judgment will be with fire. His face is like the sun, just like it was in the transfiguration. And then it tells us his feet are like pillars of fire and that takes us to the altar made out of brass. He's standing on the sea, which is the earth. Jesus is the Lord of all creation. Seas represent nations in the Bible. The Lord of the nations and the Lord of creation. He has a foot and a foot of judgment on both of them. The beast came out of the sea, but Jesus doesn't come out of the sea. He comes down. And stands upon it. His legs stand as a judgment and a guiding light. It tells us as he has a loud voice like a roaring lion. So turn with me to Proverbs 19 verse 12. See what we see there. Proverbs 19 and verse 12. The king's wrath is like a roaring lion, and his favour is like dew on the grass. Yes. The king's favour is like a roaring lion. Shows what mode the Lord is coming. This was a judgment. This mighty angel, of course, is the Lord. Coming in his judgment on the nations. And why did he come down? Well, it tells us here in Revelation 10, in verses 6 and 7, he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the seas and the things that are in it, that there should be a delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, and he declared it to his servants, the prophets. What is the Lord coming to? Well, he's coming to call time. See, chapter 10 isn't a judgment. It's not talking about a judgment. It's talking about the movement of the Lord. The Lord is coming from the throne room to the earth. He's getting ready for the final war, the battle of Armageddon. He's calling time. 
Just turn with me to 2 Peter 3, verses 8 to 10. What is that time that is calling? 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10. But you must not but you must not forgive this one thing, dear friends. The day is like a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some th people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, then the thief will pass away with a terrible noise. Sorry, the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. There we go. So, to give you the full picture now, why is the angel coming, why is the Lord coming down from the throne room to the earth? It's the final judgment. This is the end of all things. What will move the Lord from his throne? It will be the end. And it will be that period, that second coming of Jesus that then brings in that millennial reign. So that's what moves him. Now the question is, why is that in Micah and why is that in Revelation 10? Because Revelation 10 isn't Revelation 20, which is the end of it. So why is it there and not, why is it in the middle and not at the end if this is the Lord moving into position? Well, there's a reason. Because the Lord is actually telling John to do something. First of all, he tells him to go and take the book that's in the angel's hand. The word for this is an unusual word. It's only used here. It's not the same word as the scroll that the lamb went and got. It's Bibli Aridion. And I'm not going to say that again because I won't say it right. It's the only place it's found and it literally means a pamphlet. Go and get the pamphlet from the guy. Go and get the little book. It's a little book, and he's told. Well, he doesn't tell us what's in it. Like the funders aren't told what we're told what they say. But all we know that he is told is, eat it. And when you've eaten it, and when it's bitter in your stomach, and when you understand its message, go and prophesy it, not just to the Jews, but to all the nations. Because this is what we're seeing. And we're going to do a longish reading now to kind of understand, because somebody else had to do something similar to this. So we're going to turn to Ezekiel, and we're going to read chapter 2, all the way through to chapter 3 and verse 4. Ezekiel 2, through to 3, 4. <coughs> then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people, who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed, trans transgressed against me to this very day. And I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them the same book. It's the same scroll. Ezekiel has to eat the same thing. It's sweet in his lips. It's bitter in his stomach. And he's also got to go, but he's specifically going to Israel. What's it all about and what do we understand? Well, it's the warning. You see, here in Revelation chapter 10, the Lord 
but John is seeing the vision. And the Lord says to him, you were seeing this, John. Now take it, eat it, and I am sending you back to the beginning. Because John's from the beginning of the church. But what his vision is, is the end of the church. He's seeing in the book of Revelation the end, but he's actually at the beginning. So the Lord has given him the message that one day there will be a final judgment. One day the Lord will return. One day his wrath will be poured out. One day I will actually come from heaven and I will come down to the earth and judge. Now, take that message, go right back to the beginning and preach it to everybody. So that all those generations between that moment and the moment that what you saw happens, they know that it's coming. Remember Jesus said over and over again, the Lord will come like a thief in the night if only the householder had known that he was supposed to return. But then he also says, this day should not overtake you. Because we as the church should know that Jesus is coming. We should know that the bridegroom comes back at night. We should know that's when the thief comes. And therefore we should be ready. Why? Because we've been given the instructions. We've been given the clear message. We've got what John was given because he came back and he wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote and he explained it and he described it. And this is exactly what we see back in Micah chapter 1. So you can go back to Micah 1 now. In Micah chapter 1, we see the same thing. The Lord moves down to proclaim something at the beginning which will be fulfilled at the end. And its proclamation isn't just to Israel. It says, hear all you peoples. It's to all the world. All the world listen to the message that I am sending Micah to. Listen to the guy who's coming out of this place of victory to deliver this message because I will be coming down at the end of this. So listen to what he is saying. The Lord is about no excuses. The reason that he tells us exactly the way it will go is so that you cannot turn around and say, well, if I'd known, then I would have. Because... He's given you the instructions. I will be breaking into your house tonight at 3.14. Oh, if only I had known. Well, you do know. Get your club out. Because he's telling you. So, this is exactly what we're seeing here in Micah. And it's a message that wrath is about to be poured out. And how do we know that? Because, well, when the Lord touches the floor, we see the rocks start to melt, it says. It melts like wax before the presence of the Lord. That's something that we like to hear in choruses. And we like the awesome power of this idea of it. And it makes you think about volcanoes and the, the molten rock burning away the side of a, a mountain as it starts to pour down. But Israel in the Middle East has no volcanic regions. There is no activity of that kind of volcanic. It isn't in their culture to understand volcanoes, to understand molten rock. So when they write images like when the presence of the Lord melts rock like it was a candle, you sit there with a, a, one of them little blow torches that you used to light the oven. You know, you're melting your candle and you're melting it away. You go, no, that's awesome. It's awesome. I'm melting candles. And you see that all just runs down and it drips down. Like that time that uh, the, I tried to lift the candle and realized that was really stupid because it's hot and I'm holding a melting wax in my hand. That was really bad. And then it took me ages to get it all off my hand. But I kept my calm. It's a, an understanding. Nothing is more permanent than a mountain. That sense of age and ancientness of a mountain that's been there long before people have seen or dwelt in that land. So they, they're like, they go back to the beginning. That's how people felt about them. And here's the Lord. He is more awesome than something that is so old and so powerful that 
his presence, his thought, just melts it away. That's the wrath that the Lord is coming in. And it's fulfillment. Well, the link with Revelation 10 is because that's the final fulfillment of what Micah 1 is talking about. What all of Micah is talking about. But because prophecy is pattern, it also has a fulfillment in its direct meaning. See, at the end of Judah, when Judah finally succumbs to exactly the thing that Micah is saying will happen to them, that they will be carried off into exile, another prophet is prophesying. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And at one moment he was arrested and he was sentenced to death for having prophesied the very same thing that Micah prophesied. And for a short time, and a short time only, some of the people grew a moral conscience. And they went before the king and said, is it right? Well, let's read it. Because Micah's name appears again at the end. Just turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 26. And let's read verses 18 to 19. Jeremiah 26, verses 18 to 19. Micah of Morsheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be ploughed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah ever put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favour? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them. But we are doing great evil against ourselves. Verse 19. Well done. So Micah here at the end, when Judah is about to be carried away, when Babylon's about to come and take them away and destroy the whole place, and everything that he has said here is fulfilled. The Lord told Micah at the beginning, and at the end, it was fulfilled. The Lord came down, and by the end, the people still did not respond to it. However, for a short time, they did. But in the end, everything that Micah said would happen is exactly what happened. Now, what was the voice of the Lord stirred for? Why was it that the Lord came down? What was it that they'd done wrong? What was it that caused all of this instance that will in the end lead to their carrying away to Babylon in the way that they did? Well, we read it here in verse 5. It says, All of this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? We're back to Samaria again. And now we understand why there are five minor prophets before this sixth one. The reason that the five books that have gone before is, is because we now understand exactly what those sins are. We've actually become, over these five books that we've looked at, quite adept at understanding exactly what was going on in Samaria. This false religion created by Jeroboam because he wanted to keep control. When a king creates a religion so that he can keep control of the people, Jeroboam took the bits that he liked out of it and then he created his own version. But he moved all the feast days and he moved all of these things and he didn't even believe it was God. He just didn't want the people going off to Jerusalem worshipping God. So he created his own religion. This is exactly what's happened in history. This is where we get the Catholic Church from. That's exactly the same thing. So, we know that we've got this false religion so that Jeroboam could remain in power. The introduction of Baal worship by Ahab, bringing that in. Then there was an inability to change even though Elisha and Elijah were sent to that nation to greater prophets that were not. We had the corruption of the whole society from the poorest to the richest and the richest ripping off the poorest and the poorest thinking the richest were the greatest. 
and celebrating them for ripping them off. Misusing the worship of God and using the things of the poor so that they felt they could get closer to a God and it wasn't even God. The Lord even says to them, you're not even my children anymore. You are illegitimate children. You've got a different dad. I know who your mother is, but I'm not your father. I don't even recognize you anymore. We get this whole society walking into a road of unbelief. So it's that sin, that Sumerian sin that we've learned from Hosea, that we've learned from Amos, that we've learned from Jonah, and the penalty of which we've learned from Joel. To the hearers of Micah at this time, all these things had already been prophesied. Hosea and Amos and Jonah, they've all done their works. This is the generation that comes after. They've heard them, they've read them, they understand them. They know exactly what that northern kingdom is like. And we learn this about Micah. He prophesies during the reign of three Judean kings. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. That actually represents a really long period of time. It's 30 years. It's a 30-year ministry. Unlike Amos, Micah was a full-time prophet. This was his occupation. He did this for a living. However, the minor prophets are called so because they just have one message. So how can you take one message and stretch it over 30 years? That's called flogging a horse. It's dead. Get off the horse. Change the message. We've heard it. You know, that happens. I remember sitting under a previous pastor who actually had been in 30 years, and we all felt like we could have a sign under our chair that stuck up and went, heard this one. We've heard this one. You did it last week. Heard it before. I'm sure you'll all be doing that with me soon. But then, <laughs> heard it. Heard it. Oh, it's that story again. <laughs> That's it, yes. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. <laughs> so, how do you do it? Well, it's agreed that although Micah was a professional prophet, he's a contemporary with Isaiah, probably would have prophesied just as much as Isaiah did. Much of what he said, he just didn't record in this letter. All he recorded in this letter was what was important to the one message he was given. So instead of actually having one prophecy through the seven chapters of the book of Micah, we've actually got three prophecies. The first one is contained in chapters 1 and 2. The second one is contained in chapters 3 to 5. And the third one is contained in chapters 6 to 7. So why only record these three? Well, again, it's believed. Because each one is a summary of of Micah's message under each one of these kings. Chapters 1 to 2 with Jotham, chapters 3 to 5 with Ahaz, and chapters 6 to 7 with Hezekiah. So we'll look at each of these kings to help us understand the time period that Micah was actually prophesying to. They're very different leaders. They all did very different things. One of them was exceptionally wicked. One of them was really good. And one of them was the Goldilocks, somewhere in between. But what the message of Micah shows us here is you've got this Sumerian disease over there. And there's a message that comes through the whole of this book, but is particular to this first chapter, which links to something that Paul said. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's read verses 6 to 7. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 6 to 7. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? 
Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh, fresh, fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Amen. So in a scripture there in 1 Corinthians 5, which teaches us that the only form of discipline a church has at all, and it's certainly not the first piece of thing that you ever do, but the only form of final discipline that we have is as a church to collectively put somebody out. Because if we don't, then our association means it always has a chance to spread through the church. There's always a connection that spreads through. Yeast that goes into bread and it blooms through the whole loaf. It spreads like a festering wound. If you think about a wound that's diseased. A couple of weeks ago, I rushed down on a Thursday because my mum had been admitted to hospital because her toe had gone jet black. I mean, it was jet black, you know. And when I went to see it, this impression that my mum had lost a toe, it was dead. Now, actually, what it's turned out to be was a bruise that's just come to the top and that she's under a certain amount of... Uh, moisturizers and, and physio and they hope it'll all come out very clear because they did all the tests to make sure. But that idea when something goes dead, you've got to cut it off because if you don't cut it off, it will spread through the whole body and the minute it hits a major artery, a major thing, then it's gone. It'll go everywhere and that's the end. So it's that understanding. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And how do we know that's what this is? Well, back to Micah 1, we read in verse 9. Her wounds are incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people. It has come to Jerusalem. This disease that Hosea and Amos were sent to denounce because the rejection of Elijah and Elisha and even the message of Jonah to Jeroboam the second, it spread throughout the nation and it didn't remain at the borders. You know, they say it today, viruses do not respect international boundaries. They don't have passport control. They'll cross over them, regardless of. Part of the joy of being an island nation it means it's got to get on a boat. But it's not uncommon for it to get on a boat. And spread over and come to it. So the idea and the understanding of what we see is it has become festering. And even though the destruction of Samaria as a place, which will be utterly destroyed, its idols smashed up and drawn to a pulp, exactly like Micah has said here, something we read the very last good king of Judah does. We read Josiah does it. And just a time we won't turn to it, but if you want to put it in your notes, 2 Kings 23 verses 15 to 20, what we read there is Josiah goes, it's been abandoned. Israel's already been taken captive. There are other people living there, but he goes there. He goes to Bethel and he smashes up those idols. He smashes up everything, he even smashes up the priests bones that served in that place he gets rid of the lot so that there is not even a single trace that that religion ever existed ever and yet after Josiah it still seems to have the effect of becoming a festering wound because that's the problem even literally destroying everything and making it like it was an emetically sealed, clean environment where every ounce of bacteria has now been killed and Dettol has done its work, the disease still kept spreading. The Sumerian illness grabbed hold of the people of Judah. That's why putting them out is the only viable option. The message to Micah was not one which he personally took joy in. He is not a prophet who delighted in going and telling his people, you've got an incurable disease. You've caught it from your brother. And you've got it now. 
We see him take on the title of the nation here in verse 8. As a patriot, he talks about how he will howl and wail. As a Judean, he is not happy that this is his message. As a man who is coming from a place of victory, he can't believe that he's got to say this thing to his people. The phrase is a poetic one. Just to show you exactly the calamity that Micah generally saw this situation as. Wailing is a man who mourns the loss of a beloved person. He's absolutely inconsolable. He's howling. He's not wearing any bright garments. He's torn the clothes that he has. Even the sackcloth is not enough for him. He is distraught. He is a man who is beyond grief. Because it wasn't a message of hope. It genuinely was not the kind of message you ever want to hear being set out in your church. It tells us his wailing was like the jackals, like the owls, like the ostriches, some versions say, but it isn't ostriches because nobody knew what an ostrich was back then. That's, that's a King James-ism for you. His animals would be like those howls would be like the animals that feed on the dead, carrion. So in other words, you know, you think about hyenas and their kind of midnight screams as you hear them. They go and they're not, that's how the howling will be. Because it's like feeding on the dead. That's how bad it is. What an image to receive from a place of victory. You think that you, you've got it and then all of a sudden you get actually this is exactly what the Lord is telling you. Micah is not prophesying, he's lamenting. There's no prophecy yet. And he starts his lament by going through all of these places but he starts in verse 10 by repeating something that was actually said by David. And it was said by David at Saul's funeral. It was said as a eulogy. Just turn with me to Second Samuel 1. And let's read verses 17 to 27 together. Second Samuel 1, 17 to 27. David took up, up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. And he ordered that the people of Judah be taught that this lament of the boar, it is written in the book of Jasher. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, may no showers fall on your terrace fields, for though the for there the shield of the mighty was despised, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, the sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swift, swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. Now, I don't mind if David does my eulogy when I die. That's a lovely thing to say. He's just come out with, I mean... Sometimes you get to do a funeral and the family have got nothing good to say about the person and you've got nothing to good about, say about the person. The only thing you can come out with is that they, they really enjoyed fishing. They were good at fishing. They did fishing for six, six years of their life. Came back from fishing and all the family had left. But they were good at fishing. Kind of. <laughs> that actually happened to a friend of mine. But uh, Saul tried to kill David. These are not necessarily the words that you would probably put on somebody's eulogy. First of all, you wouldn't want to do his eulogy. But he didn't rejoice. He didn't want the Philistines rejoicing. He didn't want anybody rejoicing. And the one guy who came up to him rejoicing, he had his head cut off for doing it. 
So everybody else learned there'll be no rejoicing over Saul's death. <laughs> Not near David anyway. <laughs> you see, David utters heart-wrenching words over the loss of a man who actually was godless. In the end, his last action was to consult a witch. The man walked further and further away from God, and as we saw Sunday morning, he ended up being rejected by God because he never feared God, and he didn't believe in God, and he didn't follow the words of the Lord. And yet, David, not for the first time, because he does the same thing for Absalom, comes out with these wonderful words. Micah's heart is exactly the same. He is weeping and lamenting for a people who are actually evil. He's weeping for the nation who is turning from the Lord, who is like God. So we might therefore be able to say that Micah's heart is exactly the same as the Lord's heart was in this situation. A weeping and lament, yes, of people who have turned their back on him, but he isn't happy about it either. Never think that the Lord rejoices in bringing the wicked to hell. He doesn't. That cry, Absalom, Absalom, if only I could have died in your place. Those are the words of Jesus. I did die in your place. Why did you not take my death as your sacrifice? Why? But they don't. What a lament. It takes it to each part of Judah that it actually represented high points in Judah's existence. And it takes the rejoicing from them. Don't rejoice in that. Don't, don't rejoice in that anymore. Don't look at these things. In fact, they're a lie now. Don't enjoy them. It's a lament. The sins of Israel have spread to Judah. And like Israel, they will lead to its consumption. However, unlike Israel, it will not lead to its destruction. Because Micah then prophesies now. Because he sees the future. Micah, our Christmas prophet, sees what he is actually about to prophesy about. In verse 15, he spies him, an heir to David. It says in verse 15, O oh, inhabitants of Marashah. Marashah actually means inheritance. So the inhabitants of the inheritance, the glory of Israel will come back to Adullam. That cave where the worthless and the destitute and the angry all fled to. Where people who were driven out of their homes. I preach this message in the church. I believe we as a church need to be a cave of Adullam. Where Christians who are being driven out of their churches, who are lost or have been lost, haven't even gone for so long, they can come and find this a place of refuge. Because all of those worthless men that came to that place, they left that place and became David's mighty men. And Adullam went from being a cave to being a fortress. It might be where people run to. It might, as I said, a lot of people are in our church and this isn't where they wanted to be. But they found themselves here. Sometimes... They were running so far they didn't realize where they ran into. But now we're here. It's time for us to start turning this into a refuge that the people can run to and be safe and leave mighty men and women of God doing the work that God has called us to. He spies him. He's seen the king. He's seen the saviour. He's seen an heir and he's seen the fortress will be rekindled and the Lord will raise his banner once again. But what he sees is far off. His message, his plea to all who will hear is this. Just go into the deepest of mourning. To shave your head completely is to end a Nazarite vow. To shave your head completely is to be in the deepest state of mourning. Certainly if you're a woman. It's a brave move. It suits some. To shave your head completely 
means you understand the situation that you're in. Because that heir is the other side of an exile. Your sons will be torn from you. Your nation will be destroyed. You will go into exile. But after, there'll be an heir. There'll be an Adullam. You'll come back. Is this prophecy certain? Can anything change it? Is this the only way that's going to happen? Well, what we learned from Jonah, and as we read in Jeremiah, that Hezekiah did with this message, they do change their ways. They do repent. They do ask God for mercy. And the God of mercy will show that mercy. No one is beyond that mercy. But in the end, the history of Israel teaches us that what Micah said, the wound would not heal fully. It would have its moments when it looked like it had, but it didn't completely. The same spreading, festering disease would come through, despite it being cut off and destroyed by Josiah. So how is it possible that having completely cut it away, that it would still consume them to need to be exiled for a period? How is that possible at all? Well, the answer to that, we have to actually look at the king to whom Micah's first prophecy exists. And that first king is King Jotham. So clearly there must be something that Jotham is doing in the society, which is why Israel's sin has spread into Judah. So turn with me to 2 Kings 15, and let's read the story of King Jotham. 2 Kings 15 and verses 32 to 38. <coughs> Yes, please. In the second year of Pekah, Pe son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. As for the other events of Jotham's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals, annals of the king of Judah? <laughs> in, those days, <laughs> in those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram and Pekah, son of Ramallah, against Judah. <laughs> Go on, get it out of your system now. <laughs> Jotham rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David, the city of his father, and Ahaz, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, every time we look at, at these kings and we're looking, what did they do wrong? What's gone wrong? It's because somehow the leader has let the people down. He's fallen short. He's brought something in to destroy. But that life... Well, it read like John Major's Prime Minister, didn't it really, that did it? It was the most boring man in politics. I always remember the spitting image dolls of, uh, of John Major, and the, the scene, it was just nice peas. It was always peas, just nice peas. Can't believe you watch spitting images, sinner. See, where have they gone wrong? What's Jotham done wrong in that chapter? It's a mystery. Jotham's history just reads like it's so boring. There's nothing exciting about him. Where are the wars? This is like GCSE history. There's nothing exciting in it at all. It's just an industrial revolution in medicine. There's nothing that is exciting. No great battles, no wars, nothing that he's done. But then the chapter ends with that statement. Just read verse 37 again. In the days of the Lord began to send in the days in those days the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, against Judah. So it tells us at the beginning of that he did right in the sight of the Lord. He followed the ways of David, he was a good and godly king, yet the Lord sends two nations against him. Well, what's he done? Why Lord, why am I getting a beating? What have I done wrong? 
Well, every day I used to wake up, my dad would clip me around the back of the head and said, that's one on account for anything that you do wrong today. I always felt like I'd got one on account then, so I had, I had the right to do something wrong every day. Oh, I paid for this one. He did right in the sight of his Lord, but his life and his reign ends with a confederacy of nations brought about the Lord to attack him. Sounds like the Lord is trying to bring him back to some kind of righteousness. And this is exactly the time that Mike is prophesying, I'm afraid guys, you've got cancer, it's all over. And Joe from going, well, what have I done? I did everything right. It doesn't make sense. Maybe we need to look at it from a different angle. So let's look at Joe from, from Chronicles. Let's turn to Second Chronicles 27. And read verses 1 to 9. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother was Jusa, the daughter of Zadok. Jotham did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He did everything his father Uzziah had done, except that Jotham did not sin by entering the temple of the Lord. But the people continued in their corrupt ways. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. He also did extensive rebuilding on the wall at the hill of Opal. He built towns in the hill country of Judah and constructed fortresses and towers in the wooded areas. Jotham went to war against the Ammonites and conquered them. Over the next three years, he received from them an annual tribute of 7,500 pounds of silver, 50,000 bushels of wheat, and 50,000 bushels of barley. King Jotham became powerful because he was careful to live in obedience to the Lord his God. The rest of the events of Jotham's reign, including all his wars and other activities, are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. When Jotham died, he was buried in the city of David, and his son Ahaz became the next king. Now, stay in that chapter. But doesn't that make him sound even better? I mean, literally now, come on, Lord, what are you up to? Why is Micah saying these things? What, what's going on? And now it might sound like Micah's a bit of a crazy person. Yeah. How can you be saying that we've got this terrible, incurable disease that we've caught from Israel when we're doing all these wonderful things? When our king's just like, he's amazing. He's done all of these wonderful things. How is it even possible that we could be in this position that you're talking about, Micah? Because everything I've just said doesn't make any sense now. What did he do? Well, he tells us he builds the upper gate. What's the upper gate? Well, don't. Keep a finger in that, but let's just turn to Ezekiel 9. Let's read verses 1 to 6 and see what the upper gate's for. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 6. Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case at his loins. And they went in and stood behind the bronze altar. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed in linen, whose loins was a writing case. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But to the others he said in my hearing, Go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark, and you shall start from my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who were there before the temple. So Ezekiel sees in that upper gate that was only built by Jotham, this vision of a man in linen. 
and the six men behind him. The man in linen with his ink horn who comes and marks the forehead of all those who are looking upon the sinful state of the place and can't understand how it's got to that stage and they're repentant of it themselves. That's exactly a copy of what happens on Passover night when the angel of death comes through but spares everybody that has the mark of the blood. It's a copy of what we see in the book of Revelation of the pattern of those where all those who were sealed of God will survive, will be spared because the Lord himself has sealed them and all of that comes through the gate that Jotham built that Ezekiel saw in his vision. It was an inner gate. It was the gate that led to the north side of the temple where the sacrificial part takes place. That's where all the sacrifices are. Where all the animals are prepared for the altar, for the offerings. That was the gate that Ezekiel saw. That was the gate that Jotham built. The mark was the mark of righteousness. And the man in linen that he saw was Christ. Because that's what Christ does. He goes around and marks those who were his. His sheep. And he seals them and he marks them. Now that tells us something about Jotham. He was preparing the people for the judgment of God. He was using his position to make sure that everybody understood that there would be a judgment. That makes him a really good leader. He wasn't lying to the people. He wasn't saying to them, if you come to Jesus, then everything in your life will be really good. He was abundantly clear of the hardship and the trial that they were going to go through and the judgment that was coming on behalf of the Lord. He said it was going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. People aren't going to like you. And a judgment is going to come. He's preparing the way. He's putting the Lord first. So it really doesn't make any sense what Mike is up to. Then it tells us he built Ophel. And the walls upon Ophel. Now Ophel is an interesting name. It actually means a hill. So he built a hill. We know it to be Southwest Hill of Jerusalem. And he fortified it. He built it at an elevated point. And as he was building it, Micah saw it. Because Micah refers to it. Just turn with me to Micah 4, staying in Second Chronicles. Micah 4, and verses 1 to 8. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> One to eight. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. And we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. To verse 8. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken, for all people walk each in the name of the Lord his God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast of a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, ever, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So there we see it there in verse 8. After all of those promises, we see Ophel being built upon. It was very close to the fortress of Zion. And this fortress of Zion is where Micah, when he looked upon it, saw the very throne of God in the millennial kingdom. He's looking upon a time when there'll be no war, when there'll be no more, and there'll be no less, but God will 
bring about equality under his perfect rule and government. And in that time period, on this place that Jotham has built, is where the throne of God will sit. So he's built where the judgment of God will come, and he's built where the throne of heaven will rule from. He's a pretty good king. He's doing really well. He was preparing the people for a coming kingdom. He was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was building a throne that was beyond his own throne. He was believing in a king that was to come after him and would be far greater than he was. What a really good man. What on earth is Micah on about? Even Micah thinks he's a good man. Don't you, Micah? So what on earth is his sin? What has Jotham done wrong? Why is Micah howling such a dirge? Why is it that this infection will spread and will never be cured? Well, back to Second Chronicles. And let's read verse 2 again of chapter 27. And we see it. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but still the people acted corruptly. He was a great man. His people not so much. He was a godly man who taught judgment and prepared the people for a coming kingdom, but the people were corrupt. They were not interested. They weren't a part of what was going on. They didn't care. Jotham did everything that was right, but they still didn't want it. So how evil were they? Well, the other prophet that was about at this time is Isaiah. Let's just turn to Isaiah 1. Let's read that first chapter. Isaiah 1, 1 to 31. How evil were they? Isaiah tells you exactly how evil the people were. You might want to read around on this one, but that's perfectly fine. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But Israel does not know my people, do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot... To the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty has left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incest is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. 
Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your signs are like scarlet, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you, if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse 21. See how Jerusalem, once so faithful, become a prostitute. Once, once the home of justice and righteousness, she is now filled with murderers. Once like pure silver, you have become like worthless slag. Once so pure, you are now like watered down wine. Your leaders are rebels, your companions are thieves. All of them love bribes. You demand payoffs, but they refuse to defend the cause of the orphans or fat for the rights of widows. Therefore, the Lord of heaven's armies, the mighty one of Israel says, I will take revenge on my enemies and pay back my foes. I will raise my fist against you. I will melt you down and skim off your slag. I will remove you all your impurities. Then I will give you good judges again and wise counsels like you used to have. Then Jerusalem will again be called the home of justice and the faithful city. Zion will be restored by justice. Those who repent will be revived by righteousness, but rebels and sinners will be completely destroyed. And for those who, who desert the Lord, they will be consumed. You will be ashamed of your idol worship in groves and sacred oaks. You will blush because you worshipped in the gardens, of de gardens dedicated to idols. You will be like a great tree with withered leaves, like a garden without water. The strongest among you will disappear like straw. Their evil deeds with a spark that sets off a fire. And, the, and there and their evil works will burn up together and no one will be able to put you out, put out the fire. Not nice words, are they? And these are the people, and the judges, and the captains. Jotham was a good man, but nobody else was. And so even though he was teaching the judgment of God, even though he was talking about a coming kingdom, and he was prepared to say there's a greater king than I is coming, what the Lord was seeing, and what Micah was sent to say is, I'm lifting the carpet up on this and I'm showing you exactly what it looks like underneath. Because I don't listen to your prayers. Your worship means nothing to me. I don't, I'm not interested in your sacrifices of oxen and bulls. And we get to that kind of crazy place where we think that when we open our Bible, we've done God a favor. When we pray to him, we've done him a favor. When we've turned up at church, we've done him a favor. Instead of realizing he's doing us a favor. By giving us his word, by allowing us to pray to him, by allowing us to worship him. It is we who have been done the favor, we're not doing it to him. He is the whole element that comes out, how wicked the people were. It wasn't the king, it wasn't those who were in authority, he was doing what was right. Everybody was listening, shut their ears. It's about those who are playing church. And there are plenty of churches out there that are playing it. They have no idea what it is. They've lost the concept of the gospel of grace that we've been sent out to preach around the world. They've lost the whole element of that. They can't understand anymore any part of it. And they're all about community good. And I don't even understand that when we're told that the whole earth will be burnt in the end and none of it will survive. It's like building a sandcastle on the beach for you to live in. Good luck with that. Because everything that is built on this earth is not permanent. It is only the things that are built in heaven that last for eternity. And that's what the Lord sees. That's what he saw in those people. And yet they were living it at a time when they were being taught the absolute opposite. But they weren't listening. Here's the whole real truth. The reality of how evil the people were. How much that on the outside of it they professed a religion gave honor to God, but in their hearts, they were still thinking about the Sunday roast. They were somewhere else. Because this was done, it was done at a time of the greatest blessing under Uzziah. Judah was never as great again as it was under the time of Uzziah. Flocks growing, wheat being multiplied, wine being poured out, water flowing, great wealth and prosperity for everybody. And in all of that, and in all of those things that were going on, as Uzziah was providing the good, as Jotham was teaching, 
as they were receiving blessings from God, this is how they felt about him. They couldn't be bothered. And when the next good king came about, and Jotham really was a good king, they were even more corrupt, and God saw it all. Micah's contemporary Isaiah had a vision when Uzziah died. It's a really famous verse. Just turn with me to Isaiah 6. And those of you who are wondering if we're going to be finished soon, in about an hour. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't worry. It'll be, it'll be two at least. <laughs> Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 and verses 1 to 7. <laughs> Six, one, seven. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. He knew he had to humble himself. He knew he had to be broken in front of God. He knew if he didn't, his life was over. He was in a position where he was stood before the Lord, and he had to say, I'm no good. I am absolutely no good. And I can't be here in your presence, because if I'm here in your presence, I will be consumed. How can I stand with a heart that has had these, this hate, these evil intentions? And this is Isaiah, he's a prophet, he's done good things. And even he can sit there and say, it's not false humility, I'm an unclean man. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. You are holy God and I am not. I can't boldly enter into your holy sanctuary. I'm not a priest. I don't have a right to be here. I have not been given that permission. How can I be here, Lord? Only by the grace of God. That was all he could stand on. Do we put ourselves in the place? Because if we don't, well then the next few verses apply. What does it say from verse 8 to 13? Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this, pe go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their eyes ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed then i said lord how long and he answered until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant the house are without men the land is utterly desolate the lord will has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the, of the land but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming. And the terab terabinth tree, or as the oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. So before Micah has opened his mouth, the Lord has told Isaiah very clearly, the wickedness of these people is so complete, and the nature of it, it's different than it is in Israel. They're worshipping a different God. They're worshipping Baal. And those who think they're worshipping me are worshipping me wrong at a golden calf. But these people are pretending to worship me. 
and I can see their heart. And actually, their heart is going to be dulled. This is going to come to pass. This is what's going to happen. Not because the Lord is making it happen, but he knows that's what's going to happen. Here you are, Isaiah. Here's your message. Here you are, Micah. Here's your message. And once you know that to be the case, you can understand why Micah tore all his clothes off and started screaming like a madman. Wailing and crying and saying, I can't be consoled. Don't try and console me. Nobody should be celebrating. Stop your parties. Shave your head bald. There's nothing good going on. Get it sorted, everybody. Because this is what's going to happen. Yes, Hezekiah managed to stop it for a while. Yes, Josiah managed to stop it for a while. But the Lord made it clear to both of them. In the end, this disease is going to get them. So Micah wept. In the time of a good king, he revealed exactly what was going on. And we read it in verse 5 of Micah 1. I only said about Samaria. What are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? It's the people of Jerusalem. They are how the wounds spread. How did that wickedness that we've studied all these weeks go from Israel that didn't have the temple and the Levitical priesthood to Judah that did have the temple and the Levitical priesthood and the line of David? The people were full of apathy. They were just full of a heart of apathy. They didn't want to move. They didn't want to do. They didn't want to be. They just wanted to play. They just wanted to keep playing and play and play church. And this is the simple truth. If the Lord is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. The Lord bless you. And I hope that you understand the challenge of that. Next week we will look at Micah chapter 2, the second half of the Jotham prophecy, and see what the Lord has to say. Does anybody have any questions before we finish? You look like you've got one, Andrew. Oh, that's all right. It'll come back to you later. You can phone, you can phone me. Phone.